Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today worshiping you, Lord. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, here with us this morning as we learn to be disciples for you. Convict us, Lord. Convict us to hear your word today, to become better disciples each and every day, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've just completed a series on who we are in Christ. We learned so many things this past several weeks. What we especially learned, though, was that we are a new creation when we are born again in Christ. We let go of the old and become a new person in Christ, right? We begin today with this new series about discipleship. And the Bible says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. We are to discipline ourselves for God's work. When we talk about discipline, we need to talk about discipleship because the two go together. It's a little like class 201. If you haven't taken 201, please sign up for it. We have a class in October. You don't want to be left out. The Bible teaches us that mature believers are called disciples. We cannot be a disciple without being disciplined. The more disciplined I become, the more God can use me. Are you being used by God? Is he using you? Do you want to be used by God? Remember, he still uses people like he used thousands of years ago. Moses and Abraham. He used Mother Teresa. He used Billy Graham to do wonderful things for the kingdom work. And not only tremendous things, God smiles on the little things. Were you smiling when you went to the grocery store today? Were you showing Christ's love? He is pleased when you are a disciple, showing the love of Christ, even in small ways. But see, you never know. The more you become disciplined, the more he can use you in even bigger ways. Are you disciplined? Are you being used by God? He uses each and every one of us when we submit to his will for our lives. His will. So let's get into today's lesson. Please take out your handout. Everybody has one. There's a pencil there. Because once you write the acrostics and the words, and you take this home and you learn them and meditate on them, you'll remember them longer. Because you never know when there'll be a test. The good news is that we're measured up in the eyes of God by the redeeming work of Jesus Christ, right? Right? Right. right. His great commission is that we be discipled in the way of the one who redeemed us. And the mandate is that we engage in discipline to follow him. So what is a mandate? We talk about a mandate. It's a command. It's a charge. That's what a mandate is. And that's the title of the, the sermon today, the mandate. So what is that? God has charged us to do something. And Jesus, he called us to be disciples. And it says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Christ is saying this to his disciples. Just as he's saying it to each of you right now this morning. Therefore, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded, everything that is in the word of God. He has commanded, and we as disciples are to teach each other and teach others and bring them to the kingdom because he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's an eternity. 
to the very end of the age. He's staying with us. He's calling us to be disciplined and to become disciples, to baptize people in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything. So today the mandate is that we are be to become disciples to bring others to Christ. And it's exciting. Let's get into today's acrostic, discipline. The first letter is D, dare to surrender. <clears throat> it's hard to surrender, isn't it? Trust me, I know. We're called to surrender to God and his will for our lives so that he can transform us into the image of his son. We want, though, to get in line with what our image is of ourselves, not who he sees us as, right? And we, we have to admit that we want what we want it when we want it, right? I just had this discussion with someone Saturday. She said, you know, I want what I want when I want it. Yeah, I know. And I shared with her. And I have to tell you a story about the airport. We were gone for 10 days. Thank you. Could you tell? <laughs> yes, happy birthday. <laughs> now I fought telling you this story. I even said to my spouse, I said, Barb, you know, I was really a good Christian for 10 days. I, was real, I really was, honest, for 10 days. I was a good pastor, Christian pastor. In the last five minutes of that trip, I wasn't. And I fought about telling this story. And I even went to her and I said, well, how would you tell the story? She said, well, I don't tell a story. You're the storyteller. And I said, I know. But see, I keep going through this story in my mind and the Holy Spirit keeps wanting me to tell more. And I don't want to surrender to that. Because I don't want my congregation to know that for five minutes out of ten days, I was not a good Christian. And she said, well, you, I said, let me tell it like this. She goes, no, you left half of it out. <laughs> so I said, all right. So then Pastor Les and I call each other when, when we're both leading the church. We call each other back and forth several times, and yes, a lot. And yesterday we talked back and forth. I don't know who called me. I think I called her. She called me. And she says, so how are you going? You ready for tomorrow? And I said, no. I said, I'm struggling with something. She said, what is it? Can I talk to you about it? No, I don't want to tell you about it. Well, can I pray with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's pray. That's good. Let's pray. So she prayed, and I prayed. And so we know that prayer, she said, the Holy Spirit. And I said, you confirm what I've been saying about. I said, that's why the sermon isn't flowing, because I need to share that part. She said, you want to share it now? No, you'll hear it tomorrow. Okay, soon enough. For 10 days, I was just a good Christian. We flew from Fort Lauderdale to Pittsburgh, and we each carried two bags. And we had a carry-on, and I had a garment bag, and she had a carry-on, and an attache, and everything fit. So we each all the goods and the garment bag fit. So we had no problem, because I don't like I don't like the check bag. I just gave a little, a little article to Pastor Tom Gray that the airline was 39% of the baggage. And I, did, I had my best suits in that, in, in that garment bag. My favorite suits. I didn't want to lose them. So on the way back, we had to check those same bags. And we didn't buy anything. So they were all the same size. And I'm over there at the kiosk, keying in my first and last name. And I don't know, Barb said it. I seem to take so long. It's because I have 50,000 things in my mind. And all it asked for was first name, last name. So the lady had to come behind the counter to help me, and she sees my bags. And she says, so how many are you checking? I said, oh, zero. And I go to push, and she goes, oh, no, no, you must check one of those bags. Oh, no, no, I flew here with these, and I didn't have any problems, and I, I don't want to lose my bags. I'm not going to lose your bags. Oh, yeah, you will. You'll lose my bags. <laughs> and she says, and Barbie is whispering. Now, at this point, the lady goes back behind the counter, and Barbie's whispering to me. She says, your face is showing anger. And I go, well, I'm trying not to show my anger. 
but I don't want to check my bags. She says, well, you must remember you are a Christian. And on top of that, you're a pastor. I know that. I've been a good Christian for 10 days, Barb. I raised my voice a little bit, and I said, let me show you how I can fit this bag under the seat. And I pulled it on my garment bag, and I'm showing her, and I said, look, it's all nice and compact. She said, no. Okay, so I realized that I'm not going to win. So she put the stickers on the bag. Now, not only... Have I surrendered to the Holy Spirit this morning by telling you this? I had to surrender to, to U.S. Airways, my bag. So I take, she says, take it over there. So as I'm taking it over there, I'm watching her to see if she's watching me. And I'm thinking, I, I say to Barb, I'm not going to take it. She says, you have to take it. I said, no, I don't. I'm going to fit it in, in the plane. She says, I said, she's not watching. Nobody's watching. She's, Barbie says, I'm watching. And you're a pastor. Okay, I'll take it. So I took the bag. I take 10 steps away, and I'm still figuring out a way that I could get that bag. And finally, she says, you need to get on the plane. So we think we know what God wants. And we want to try to find scripture to base our thoughts on it. There's no scripture that talks about U.S. Airways and the bag. But I had to surrender to the Holy Spirit this morning. I didn't want to say that to you. I didn't want to say that, yes, I was trying to figure out a way. And yes, I did raise my voice a little bit. And it was hard to surrender that bag. And there are times, and we battled back and forth yesterday, the Holy Spirit and I, and that's why this sermon wasn't flowing. Because he wanted me to tell you that. Because you know what? As Pastor Les prayed, her prayer was, someone there needs to hear this. And maybe a lot of people need to hear this. And after I finish praying with her and I go back to this and it starts to flow, and I say, did you tell her, Holy Spirit? Did you share that with her? No, she didn't know. She prayed because the Holy Spirit prompted her to pray that specific prayer. I'm asking you to dare to surrender to his leading in everything. I let go of the bag, and today I will let go finally of the bag. If you've been hitting your head against the wall year after year, surrender. When you're going to dare to surrender, allow God to transform you. He will. Try God. Dare to surrender to His will. To surrender means, means to submit. We dare to surrender. As I surrendered to the Holy Spirit this morning to let you know I have a flaw, just one. And we, we struggle too as pastors with so many things, the same things that you each struggle with. So dare to surrender so that we can, I, fill it in, invest for eternity. The first one, dare to surrender, and then invest for eternity. Why do you think we're here on this earth? To make disciples of all nations. You can't make a disciple unless you first become a disciple. I can't teach you unless I first listen to the Holy Spirit. How do you do this? You begin to learn what is Jesus teaching you. You read the Word of God. You study His Word. You invest in a relationship with God, and then you invest in a relationship with each other. We study the Word, we de develop that relationship with God, and then we fellowship with each other. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
my brother this past week while I was on vacation found out that half of his house is toxic there's mold in the walls so half of his house four rooms in the house are totally destroyed within five minutes an insurance hazmat team came in with their little machines and said this entire these entire four rooms have to be totally stripped and all the walls have to be taken out and all the clothing has to be treated and the beds and the furniture are worthless they have to go and the floors have to be ripped up within five minutes he lost half of his possessions we can lose everything in an instant can we not so how are you investing in your life are you buying lots of material things how are you investing in your time? Are you spending countless hours at the bar? Are you spending countless hours on the internet? Are you watching countless hours of television? Or are you spending time in God's Word? Are you bringing others to the kingdom? First, we have to become a disciple. And I, I'm saying this to, me, to myself, too. We preach to each other. Our TV died last night. One of the TVs just died. And it was like, are we going to go get another one today? And Barbie said, no, I think God's trying to tell us something. And I said, yeah, I know, because I'm preaching it. He is. He is trying to tell us something. How much time are you spending in studying his word? Only you and God know. Our next letter in the acrostic is S. Study his word. Fill it in. Study his word. The Bible says that the first thing that a disciple must do is study his word. It says, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth. Here it is in the Bible. The truth will set you free. If there's confusion in your life right now, that is not of God. God is not a God of confusion. God's truth is clear. Confusion is of Satan, not God. Study his word and become the disciple that he has called you to be. So we've, it says, dare to surrender, invest for eternity, and study his word. Confess his leadership, the next one. Fill it in. Confess his leadership. How do we confess his leadership? Listen to 2 Timothy 2.19. It says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Are you his? Are you? Yes. Are you his? Yes. yes. He knows that you're his. He knows that you're his. If you've accepted Jesus, confess his leadership. Once we do this, remember the solid foundation of God's truth never changes. His word is never shaken. His word will never fade. Never. It doesn't change. He will never forsake us. Ignore the distractions, the next one. I. Ignore the distractions. Oh, yeah, right. That's right. Sure. Ignore the distractions, just like you did at the airport, right, Pastor Suze? Easier said than done. Distractions are not of God, distractions are chaos. And God, again, as I said, is not a God of chaos. He is a God of love, joy, peace, and compassion. For five minutes, I could have done that with that U.S. Air person. Okay. Even if I didn't feel it inside. Okay. I'll give you my bag. No. I had to fight it. I didn't want to surrender. We don't want to surrender, do we? We want to fight sometimes. James 1, 2 through 8 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, wherever you face trials, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He doesn't say if you have trials. 
He says, whenever you do, we all have trials. And it teaches us. Tough times in our lives teach us character, perseverance. I need to learn more about listening. I need to learn more before I can teach you more. I need to learn more about patience. I need to learn more about submitting to authority. The authority of an airlines, the authority of a police officer, an authority figure. So those are the things that I need to learn. So, so far, we have dare to surrender, invest in eternity, study his word, confess his leadership, ignore the distractions, and then pray for more. Fill it in. Pray for more. God says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. In this way, you become my disciples. Remain in him. Remain in him. Pray. Pray some more and then pray some more. Study the word. How often do you pray? Do you realize how important it is to pray? Barb was whispering the, after the first 30 seconds, pray. You need to pray. No, I want my bag. <laughs> remain in me and I remain in you. He calls us to remain in him. Had I remained in him in prayer through that situation, it would have been nothing. I would have trusted that God would have delivered the bag. The only way to remain in him is to stay in his word and in prayer. Constant communication to him. You struggling with something? Go to prayer. Get in the word. He will never forsake you. He will never leave you. Ever. You are his disciples. And L, leave the past behind. Fill it in. Leave the past behind. We always want to bring up the past. Why is it so hard to give it up? Imagine how our lives would be if we could only give up the past. The hurts, the anger, the disappointments, the mistakes. I challenge you for one week to give up your past. Just try it for one week. Give it up. Live as though you have left the past behind. And again, just for one week. Every time your mind wants to go back there, stop it. And remember that God has created in you a new person in Christ. Let go of the old self. You are a new person in Christ. One week. And then let me know. Did God transform your life? But you have to be honest. You have to do it. You are a new creation in Christ. The goal is to live in the new Christ. Now hear me. I'm not saying that you, you can't work through your past. That's important. It's so important to work through past situations to come out on the other side. I'm, I'm talking about constantly reliving it in your mind as if the past is all you have. The past isn't all you have. You're a new creation in Christ. Let it go for one week and see. Fill, fill your mind and your body with the word of God and with prayer and let go for one week. Then I implement his habits. Fill it in. Implement his habits. We must do that. He gave us a mind so that we can learn many things. We need to begin to incorporate his habits with his power. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 6 to 7, we see, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of self-discipline. Let go of the past. Let go of the old self. Have boldness in Christ. Have power in Christ. Be the love of Christ. 
be self-disciplined, and begin living those Christ-like habits for his purposes, for his, not ours, and name the character. We're almost done. This is a big acrostic. They give me the big ones, I think. <laughs> I'm teasing. We can really know the depth of our character. We can't know it unless we learn how we react under pressure. Right? So you, you saw how I do react under pressure. I need some work. I need work on that character. Name the character. While we were on vacation, I had an opportunity to really enjoy some characters in my life who, have, who totally believe in Christ, who have such a strong faith. I, I met with some of my aunts and an uncle. And I'm not going to tell you how old each of them is because they watch these sermons on, on the Internet. And I, I don't want any phone calls. But I'm going to mention to you that it was my Aunt Go, my Uncle Bill, my Aunt Betty, and my Aunt Sal. And one is 76, one is 80, one is 84, and the other one's 89. And they were such an important part of my growing up, and they're still such an important part of my life and all of our lives in my family. And I always take time to spend time with them, even if it's for two hours, because in that two hours, they always give me a gift, a gift of love, a gift of faith, to see their faith in action. And they're going through trials, each and every one of them right now, as, as they live their lives, they're going through trials. Two of them have fallen, one broke a leg, the other one has an infection in the leg, another one is suffering from macular degeneration, and another one is, is battling skin cancer. And you know, you think, oh my gosh, they're all going through something. How could they possibly be in a good mood? I mean, aren't they ready to give up? Look how old they are. No, they're not. The one is so upset that she missed a golf tournament and she can't wait for the next one. The other one left the day after we met to drive to Canada with his 85-year-old brother who has a heart condition. So he has eyes, though. <laughs> the other one doesn't have eyes. So the one who's 85 has eyes. The other one has a good heart. So they were going to Canada. It didn't matter. They wanted to go. The other one can't wait to get out in the garden. And the fourth one said, I missed two foreign films in the film festival, and I need to get healed so that I can go back to watching the rest of these films. And, you know, I'm hearing this, and I'm thinking, my God, some people are ready to die. And these people who you would think would be ready to go and leave this earth, I mean, they've lived a full life. They're almost 90, some of them. And they can't wait to get back into the swing of things. And when I, I said to my aunt, my one aunt, shall I pray for you? She says, yes, lay hands on me. She says, I believe in healing, and you're a pastor, so pray for me so that I can get back in that garden. So it was, and as I went, you know, I, I didn't want to touch the, the soreness, and she started tapping, praying, and she starts tapping. She says, no, lay your hands over here. I believe in healing, Suzanne, she said. I believe in it. So lay your hand where I broke my leg. So the characters, they teach us something. We learn. Name the character of Christ. It's easy to be kind to others when everything is going well. But when we're going through struggles and trials in life, it's hard. And yet, I gave you four examples of four people who firmly believe in the love of Christ, who are going through tremendous trials, who some people would have given up at this stage of life, and they're ready to get healed and to go on to the next stage. What is your character? Is it a character of integrity? Does your character have wisdom? Does your character match the character of Christ? We were created in the image of God so that we have the potential of developing the character of God within us. Is your character tainted by jealousy and immorality? 
Is your character degraded by sin? What is your character? Imagine yourself in your 90s if you had fallen. Imagine yourself now in your 40s and 50s if you're going through some of these same things. How are you going to be? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to look ahead with that positive attitude of Christ and know that any day I'm going to be healed and I'm going on because I have things to do. I have things to do for the kingdom of God. What is your character? Let's do this long acrostic together. Together. Dare to surrender. Invest for eternity. Study his word. Confess his leadership. Ignore the distractions. Pray for more. Leave the past behind. Implement his habits. And name the character. Finally, the letter E. Examine your heart. Only you and know, only you and God know what's in your heart. Are you carrying bitterness from the past? Are you angry all the time? Do you have constant fear in your heart? Do you need a spiritual heart transplant? The Apostle John would encourage people to turn away from sin and turn back to God. He could take a stony heart and exchange it for a heart that was soft, pliable, trusting, and open. In Luke 1.17 it says, And he would go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Are you ready to examine your heart for the work of our Lord today? Let's do it today. Why wait? Examine your heart right now. Do you need a heart transplant? A spiritual heart transplant. This morning, the cross is waiting for us, for each of us. I'm going to ask that you come up to the cross. You can kneel if you want to. You can stand there. We're going to do the Our Father. We're going to say it together up there. But before we do, I ask that if you're, if you're having a hard time surrendering, if you're having a difficult time going on with your life, if you're struggling with an addiction, if you're struggling with a relationship, whatever is in your heart, you don't have to tell us. God knows what's in your heart. Come up. There will be anointers here to just anoint. We can pray afterwards, after the service, but there will be the elders and pastors anointing you and then go to the cross and get that spiritual heart transplant. Today's the day to start brand new. Remember, you're going to take a week. You're going to take one week and we're going to start with it here. You're going to take one week and you're going to allow this cross to give you a heart transplant. A spiritual heart transplant. And you're not going to look back at the past. You're going to go forward in Christ. And you're going to live in Christ as a disciple of Christ. Come forward.